Well, hey, let me pray, and then we'll get started. So, Heavenly Father, I pray, um, just full of gratitude that um, a space in our city is being used for a kingdom um, advancement and preparation. Um, God, I thank you for all the students and the staff and everyone that's just taken so much time to, to, um, to create this environment, the planning, the preparation, but also I think the intentionality, God, I'm just sitting here with a ton of uh, gratitude uh, for these students who are deciding to uh, just inquire as to what you're doing um, and how they can be a part of it. So I just pray you get glory today. Um, and I pray that there's some practical um, things that uh, everyone here uh, can take away. Um, but ultimately, again, I just pray that we all leave this space uh, so much more excited about what you're doing. Um, so impressed with who you are, Jesus. And um, just get glory. Your name, amen. <coughs> all right. So um, I, I want to set like some foundational stuff for our time. And it's cool because we have, uh, I feel like a more intimate group. So. So I'm going to I'm going to save uh, hopefully, uh, you know, a decent amount of time at the end just for any questions that you guys have. Um, so at any point in time, uh, write them down and I would love to answer those um, during this time. Uh, when I think about church planting for global impact, um, I want to as I was thinking about preparing, I think I want to I want to uh, really like the last three years of my life have been extremely intentionally devoted to preparing for church planting. And so I'm not an expert in this. Um, I've had the privilege to be in spaces with people who I really feel like are experts in this. Um, and I've just had the chance to sit under some incredibly smart people. So even a lot of what I'm going to give you today is uh, stuff that I've had uh, the privilege of learning and then also being able to implement it. And so a lot of also what I'm going to talk about is can, I'm going to give you some principles, but also ways that we have contextualized, meaning the way that we have engaged our city um, to see how those principles have worked out. So um, and like I mentioned earlier, you know, being in the Inland Empire, one in every five uh, residents is an immigrant. Um, I even got to share a little bit of the vast diversity <coughs> ethnically. Um, even around this area. And if you were to drive a mile and a half this way or even this way, um, you will run into multi-million dollar homes. You'll run into people who have uh, a ton of what we like to call coin. Um, but then you can go a block. Uh, so the freeway is here. So you can go a block that way and, and hang a right and you can run into some of the um, most neglected communities that live below the national poverty line, all within like a two mile radius. Um, and so it's really important as we consider uh, the nations, we consider global impact, we're considering different ethnic cultures, different socioeconomic cultures. And so that's kind of what I want to talk to you guys about today. Um, we have a smaller group, so uh, maybe we're going to do this. Take 10 seconds, just give me your name and tell me why did you show up to this session? Sound good? Just name, why did you show up to this session? In five minutes or less. Oh, five <laughs> seconds or less. No, uh, oh man, you live in Lake Arrowhead. Yes, it's okay, it's okay. My name's Alex. Alex, Alex, start with you. Um, okay, so my name's Alex, and I came to the session because, um, I mean, I mean, church planting, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I, I don't, I mean, there's not like... Staff? You think church planting is wonderful? Great. Yes, yes. My man with the great mustache, by the way. <laughs> um, I'm Wesley, and I'm here because church is what God uses. Um, yeah, so, oh, cool. Um, I'm here because people have been leading my work to do vocational missions and church planting. Cool. And that's Ryan, everyone. Uh, and that's Will. Um, I'm just curious mostly about the how. Sure. Oh, okay. Okay. Say your name again. Okay. I'm John. I'm here to learn from Jay. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> We've been finishing the same city. This is cool. Uh, I'm John. I've been working with Chinese and just interested in the global, how, how local churches can have global impact. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my name is Hunter. I'm just more like about the local church. Sure. My name is Ella. Um, just seeing the importance of um, 
Sure. My name's Evan. All right, cool. Like it. I'm Brandon, um, and I'm just more interested in how. Sure. Were you playing up there? Yeah. Okay. What were you playing? Acoustic. <coughs> nice. Nice. I know a church that could always. Got to. And Katia. My how it works. I'm Michael. I'm interested in the how and like also if you have like practical tools to use in the ministries in my church as well. Sure, we're we'll in the back. It's me. Uh, I was excited about your guys' breakout and certain fact that I would have gotten Oh, cool. cool. Kirk, I just believe that church plan is the greatest evangelism tool under heaven. This man is lived it. I, I feel like we should trade places, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to learn two degrees. Yeah. I used to, so I used to work like with these guys. So it really is, it really is like an honor and in some ways pretty surreal to be here. Um, okay. So I'll just give you a quote uh, to start our time. And I, I want us to like dialogue about this quote. Um, I read this quote when I was in college, actually, um, and obviously I didn't apply the context to the quote. I didn't really understand it. It sounded great, and I was like, huh, that's cool, and then when, then when church planting began to be a thing, I was like, oh, okay, like, there's some layers to this, and so Mike Breen in his uh, book called Building a Discipling Culture, he says, if you make disciples, you will always get the church, but if you make a church, you rarely get disciples, what do you guys think that means? I don't know. Just let me read it one more time. If you make disciples, you will always get the church. But if you make a church, you rarely get disciples. Let's just talk about that. What are like first thoughts? And, and here it, with this face, it's not performative. Like, let's not do like a two, three minute response. It's to look impressive to other people. Just give me your quick hitting thoughts. It's the heart. What's the heart behind it? Yeah. What's the heart behind it? What's up? Like we are the church. We are. What do you mean by that? Like, like we're the body. Uh, like who's we? The disciples. Gotcha. Like, you know. Sure. Yeah. 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 If you make disciples, you always get the church. But if you make a church, you rarely get disciples. And maybe it's easier to show up at church and like, not know the why. Yeah. Sure. Sure. The Great Commission is to make disciples, not to start churches. There you go. Session over. All right, let's go. Out. <laughs> See, so yeah, I really wrestled with this, right? Like with this call to to to, to plant a church. Um, give me three volunteers, just three. Come on. All right, one, stand, two, three. Cool. You guys stand side by side. I'm still in. I'm gonna steal um, an analogy that uh, scoot over a little bit. I'm gonna steal a little bit of an analogy that Vance Pittman gave. Um, at one of our uh, Send Network uh, training sessions. So um, when I tap you, you're going to say, line to church. So let's practice. Line to church. A little bit louder than that next time. Okay. Um, when I tap you, you're going to say, make disciples. Okay. Make disciples. All right. And when I tap you, you're going to say, engage the city with the gospel. <laughs> you got the longer ones. All right. <laughs> engage the city with disciples. Wait, no. <laughs> Okay, okay. It was a long one. I know. I know. All right, you ready? Here we go. Plant the church. Make disciples. Engage the city with the gospel. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, what I would say to learning in the last three years, you guys are going to stay here for a sec, so just get comfortable. And um, what what Vance would say, and and many others, is that 95% of church planting in North America follows this model. They plant the church. Then they begin to make disciples. And then they begin to engage the city with the gospel. Now, sounds great. It does sound great. I mean, when you, uh, I'm, if I touch you, I'll, I'll make it known <laughs> that I want you to speak because I don't want you to yeah, yeah. mess up the flow, right? So, most church planting in North America, yeah. probably 95% of them, is when you start with planting the church, you start with like, oh, we gotta have like a cool mailer, like we gotta, we gotta make sure that the word gets out. And a lot of times this is rooted in, if, if 
if church planters were honest, what the city does not have that we have to bring, what the other churches aren't doing um, that we have to offer. It's like, yo, like we're this new cool church plant coming in. We do X, Y, and Z. We know you don't get that in the city. So now it's like, you'll get it from us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the ethos of that message comes across like that. And so a lot of times, right, it's uh, you, when you are just starting out to plant a church, your immediate mind's like, we got to get a storefront, we got to get a building, uh, a theater, or school. Like, that is like the <coughs> initial frame, framework of thinking. We have to get a place. What do you think is potentially wrong with starting here? It's hard. It's hard. It costs a lot. It really costs a ton of money. This ain't cheap. What are some other potentials? Like investment in... Uh physical building before the people. Sure. It's event planning. It's a what? It's event planning. It's event planning, right? It's event planning, right? And so one of the temptations of doing it like this is this missiology is often backwards because when you plant to church here and you start here, you often, you often end up engaging and interacting with people who just look like you, act like you, think like you, vote like you. And so one of the issues that you began to see in 2020 when stuff hit the fan is there was so much tension because there was a lot of people gathering for a service, but not gathering around the gospel and the Great Commission and be committed to making disciples. And so what happens when you do that 85%, I think the last stat was 85% of, of churches, uh, and I, maybe it was church plants or churches in North America are 85% are homogeneous. Which means it's like same culture, same, same type of ethnic group, like same everything. And so it's really easy to plant, honestly, if I'm being transparent, it's really easy to start a church service now. You just find some talented people. Let's get my man on an acoustic. We got some coffee. Someone to do a 30-minute TED Talk. Can you play worship underneath me to make people get in their fields? And then we'll end with one more song. We did it, y'all. We did it. We planted a church. We planted a church. <laughs> Here's the thing. Like... When we talk about global impact, y'all go try and start this this way in Afghanistan. Hey, y'all, we got some cool mailers. Talk about how, you know, we ain't your granddaddy's moss. <laughs> like, <laughs> we'll provide the rug for you. You ain't got to show up with the rug. Right? Like, try this, try this method in some cross-cultural context. Bro, you'll be on your first trip out of the, of the country. Like, that's not even allowed, right? But when you engage the city with the gospel, and then you begin to make disciples, what happens? When you plant a church. Right. I'll let you guys know. You guys have on that, right? <laughs> so I tell you that that's the framework that I want us to think through. When, when I'm discussing this um, with you guys today, and I'm going to give you practicals of what this looked like for our church. So we have a couple in our church who is actively thinking about going to the nations. They are part of our launch team. So, so if I were to go based off this pretty stereotypical model of North American church planting, that actually doesn't prepare them and equip them to take what we're doing here to the world. It doesn't prepare them. Because the places that they're looking at, like you will be persecuted for your faith. So you're not going to throw up a poster. You're not going to throw up a mailer. You're not going to do these things because you know that persecution could be inside it. So we have to understand that, and I'm giving you, I'm trying, I'm going to spend like high level themes and narratives of scripture um, and then I would encourage you to go look back. But when you read all throughout um, scripture, this narrative of Jesus going into cities, pronouncing that the kingdom is here and has come.
Paul going into cities. Like you think about the way Paul engaged cities. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. <coughs> but all throughout the New Testament, Paul didn't go into cities starting church services. When he was thinking about the Lydia's of the world, like he was going in to make disciples. I, I, one guy said, he was like, yo, isn't it crazy that Paul never pastored a church that he planted? Like he just made disciples and your boy was out. And he was going to city to city. At the, in Luke 4, I love here when Jesus is talking, he says, uh, when it was the day he went out and he made his way into a deserted place, but the crowds were searching for him. They came to him and they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, it is necessary for me to proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God to other towns also, because I was sent for this purpose. Going from town to town, spreading the good news, advancing the kingdom. And so for us as a church, we had to understand what success looks like in the kingdom of God in church planting. Because most of the time in our Western world, success in church planting and even in disciple making looks like up and to the right. It looks like metrics. I tell you the number one question I get, people ask me, how is your church doing? They're mo I would say 95% of the time, I, I bait people into this all the time because I never tell them how many people are, are a part of our church. And I'll, so I'll give them an answer like someone the other day said, man, how's your church doing? I said, to be honest with you, I think we're doing really good because all 11 of our leads that helped us start the church, like their families are healthy, they're engaged in the city, and they're actually coming back this year in a position to continue to lead and disciple people in our church. I think we're healthy because of that. Oh, cool, cool. But how, how many people you got on Sunday? I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. Like, I know, I know where you're going with this. And I think one of the... One of the temptations is when you start a, a plant a church service and you get a ton of people come, like I'll be, I'll be frank, we had 405 people at our grand opening service. Can I, I'll tell you how many people I was getting hit in the DMs and emails, how did you guys do it? I said, look, I don't know if you want, I don't know if you actually want the route in which we had to take to get here because we had to suffer we had, to, we had to labor in our city to build trust. We had to do things that were engaging the city with the gospel before we even got to having this really cool long service. And I wasn't even tripping because most of those people left for service too. They, they tell church planners, be careful not to get too excited, right? Because week two, like half the people are, are gone. And week two, we didn't have 150, we, we dropped from 400 to 250, week two. We weren't concerned with that because we're not concerned with just planting a church to start church service. We're concerned with the kingdom advancing and people taking God's kingdom authority in to where they live, where they work, and where they play. And so when you start with engaging the city with the gospel, it's going to mess you up. It really will. Here's why. 2000, uh, in 2043, uh, demographers say that there will be no majority population in America. No majority population in America, which means that the, the church is going to need to unlock the door to the multi-ethnic, multicultural expression of what the church should look like in North America. The challenge of this is that when you read through uh, the way that Jesus and his disciples engaged uh, cities, bringing the good news of the kingdom, it did not skip over socioeconomic status. It did not skip over different cultural ethnicities. And so when you engage the city with the gospel, it is extremely messy because you are engaging with different people. You are engaging with different socioeconomic status. Can I be honest? It is so tempting to spend majority of our time in parts of the Inland Empire, specifically in the city of Redlands, it is, it's beyond tempting to spend the majority of your time in a place where you know where all the money is. Where you know where all the money is. I can tell you, we can go and we can do majority of our engagement and community, uh, community engagement. We can spend majority of our time in pockets of the IE and city because we know where the, we know where the money is. But that's not, that's not what it looks like to engage a city. 
I mean, think about, think about this. Think about in Acts 16, Paul, he engages like this pretty boss business lady, Lydia, disciples her. Then he's, uh, then he's bringing the gospel to a demon-possessed woman. Then he's bringing the gospel to uh, the dude in, in, in jail, right? The, the guy who was in the jail. And it's like, yo, like Paul didn't have, like his game plan wasn't to go look for Saddleback Sam over there who was in the middle class, upper class, and engage with them to see the church growth movement happen. You know what I mean? It's like, no, he engaged the city wherever he was to bring the gospel to them. I, I Trust me, I, I mean, there's, here's the thing. We, we've done like door hangers. We've done different things, but it wasn't the first step. It was never the first step. I spent six months with 11 other people on our team, discipling them, engaging the city with the gospel with them, before we ever talked about a church service. Six months in our living room, in our city, before we, everyone likes to talk about the apps. What do I mean by that, right? So most of you, if, if you're wise, you probably have an iPhone, right? And Except you, because no. um, <laughs> you live in the mountains, man. Y'all got right, horrible right. service. <laughs> but most people love just the apps of the iPhone. No one really like, unless you're like super geeked out. You're like, yo, I want to know about the operating system, how fast it's going, blah 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 blah. Most people, especially within church planting, when they see a new church, or even when people engage with us, like they want to know about the apps of the church, the ministries, how you guys do all these things. It's always telling to me when someone walks through the door if they've ever been a part of a church or gone to church or if they have no church experience. Because the first thing people ask is like, hey, what ministries do you have? What do you do? And I say, no, before, when you engage the city with the gospel, what we're trying to do with our team is build an operating system. It's how we think. It's how we live. It's how we act. And so the operating system first starts with engaging the city with the gospel. The best compliment, if you were to ask me what is the thing that you are most proud of about Portrait Church, the best compliment I get is when people walk through the door and say, wow, for the first time I've been a part of a church that looks like my city. That's like the best compliment someone can give us. And part of what we have to do when you engage the city with the gospel, you look, you engage the city, and you're looking for the idols of the city. The idols of the city. When Paul visited Athens in Acts 17. He's waiting for his boys to show up and he's walking around the city. And he even quotes back to them because they have inscribed this to an unknown God. And he's like, yo, let me tell y'all about this unknown God who wants to be known and his kingdom is going to come. He, he is able to contextualize what he sees and what the idols are of that city. And now he's able to bring them a gospel picture that can bring renewal that can bring transformation. But the problem with if you start to start a, a, a church service, why you end up getting people that look like you and act like you is because you don't really know the needs of the city yet. So when you engage the city with the gospel, what you are doing is, is you are living amongst the people in the city and you're beginning to have conversations. I spent a, a year in our city asking people from the mayor to uh, homeless people to workers on this side of the freeway, that side of the freeway. Hey, if you could change one thing in this city, what would you change? Hey, if, if there is one thing that can make uh, you enjoy living here more, what would that be? Hey, what's the worst part about living here? Oh, man, the answers that I got? Like, it began to tell a picture and a story that this freeway line was a barrier. It was a wall between the north side of the freeway and the south side of the freeway. The south side, which is historically white, wealthy, and the north side of the freeway, which is predominantly black and brown and different socioeconomic statuses. It began to be very clear from the narratives of the city that this is a city whose idol is they want to look good on the outside, but oh, they got some cobwebs in that closet. They got some cover-ups. They got some very performative elements in the city. But man... There's no change. There's no renewal. We have neglected areas of the community that need to be engaged in. And so as a team, we engage 
the city to understand what the idols are, what were the challenges. The, th- the second thing we did is uh, we got really clear on defining terms, yeah. like insanely clear. Uh, one of my mentors, uh, Rich, Pastor Rich, he says, uh, your definition of the gospel will always determine the scope of your mission. So we got insanely clear as a team for six months. I love what, uh, probably one of the breakout sessions, uh, peace. I love how Brian was kind of leading that um, to, to describe it, I mean, with the peacemaking. Because a lot of times there's conflict on teams. There's conflict um, within church plants, organizations, whatever it may be. It's because you haven't really defined the terms clear. And so for us, like when we talk as a launch team of 13, when we talk about the gospel, do we all have the same definition? Because if we don't, we are all individually going to be providing a different remedy as we engage the city with the gospel. And so it was very clear for us that we had to define the terms. One of the ways that we engage the city with the gospel was instead of a timeline, I use milestones. And so our team had to find 200 people. We had to curate a list of 200 people that were either far from God, close to us, not friends, but people that we had built relations with, relationships with, with in our city, where we worked, where we took our kids, wherever the case may be. We all had to collectively put 200 people on a list before we did a preview service. Yo, we were supposed to do our first preview service in May. We didn't do it till June. We didn't have 200 people. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to cultivate a culture of importance. I am trying to create a DNA where it's like, yo, we will move the launch of a service if we do not live on mission and we are not committed to this milestone together. So you know what it did? Oh, man. Like, we had people that didn't fully move into our city yet. They started shopping in the city. They started, after our meetings, they started, all right, look, Sunday, Sunday night after we hang out at Jay's, we're going to go to Trader Joe's here in the city. They started going rhythmically the same time, same day, started meeting people. It was amazing. It was amazing. And so what we, just, what we needed to do with that was, as a team, like I said, we are trying to cultivate missional habits because once you start getting into the starting the church service, oh man, like it's crazy. What'd you say? That takes over. It takes over. It takes over. And the last thing I didn't want to do was to have a group of people who were so used to letting the church service do the work that they didn't live on mission and know that that was actually core to who we are as a church. And so that's why we had the milestone. And I'll tell you, um, Uh, uh, On a more personal note, this has transformed even the way my wife and I have led out in this. Because sometimes when you are building the habits of engaging the city, it costs you something. Literally for us, it costs us financially. (laughs) My wife has engaged in this thing called cycle bar. So she wakes up in the morning to go cycling. You would ask my wife a year ago, she hates working out, but she found something that she can enjoy doing that she shows up weekly, consistently to. She is the only Christian or follower of Jesus in this. She got added to like a group chat with like 13 other women because she shows up consistently to engage the city by cycling. One of the girls actually is now, she's come to church. She's actually helping volunteer in our kids ministry. And, but that didn't happen until five months after my wife had been cycling. Because it's engaging, it takes time, it takes consistency. Like, our vision is to give people a renewed picture of Jesus in the church. We were just talking about how a lot of times people think churches are cults, especially out here. We have the the largest Mormon temple in the IE. Um, They meet in the woods, which is low-key cultish. Um, No, they don't meet in the woods. This church is called Church in the Woods. Sorry. I didn't want to throw shade on it. But, um, But the reality is engaging the city with the gospel is messy. And it's hard. And I'll speak for myself. We moved into our house across the street from me. Like the first day when we moved in, y'all, my neighbor put up a flag. I'm not even going to tell you what the flag said because y'all can imagine all the flags that we got today that the people lay stake and claim on what, <laughs> what they believe and how they believe. So my neighbor throws up a flag and I'm like, day one, 
Like, I just moved in here. Like, and so, again, like, just feeling convicted that, no, like, we are called to live on mission, engage our city with the gospel, engage our street with the gospel. I'm like, oh, shoot. So, you know, we, we throw out a mailer. We take our kid, not a mailer. We, we made a flyer for our street. Hey, we're just donuts, free coffee this Saturday. Would love to invite you guys. I just want to, you know, introduce ourselves, hang out with people in our community. So, of course, he's the first one to come because he lives right across the street from me. Him and his wife, they come. Uh, man, we, it, it was cool getting to know them, honestly. And get, like, he, he is not someone that I would regularly hang out with. I'll just tell you that. <laughs> just being honest. <laughs> but, like, he doesn't know Jesus. He doesn't know Jesus. And on our street, all we did, we spent, we spent $10 on making a little handout thing that my kids helped me make. We took our kids around the block, and we just put them on the doors, knocking. Some of my kids got to, I, I'm, I'm wanting them to see me and, and, and moms engage our city. We spent $20 on three dozen donuts, and then we got, like, coffee, and that was it. I think we spent $40 for the whole thing. We had 18 people from our neighborhood show Lady over here, she's like, yo, we've been living here for 35 years. We've never, we got family over and we're supposed to be celebrating someone's birthday, but this has never happened. And we just wanted to come and show up because, like, we're just excited that this is going on. 18 people show up. Lesbian couple across the street shows up. Here, it's the weirdest thing now that I'm a pastor. And that's, like, the first thing everyone asks you. What do you do? I'm like, dang it. I was hoping, like, I'd get at least, like, a couple days before we, you know. But, y'all, they're, they're, like, having a conversation. And it gets super awkward. Super awkward. Oh, you're a pastor. I'm like, oh, yeah, how do you guys do it to over here? Okay, cool. Man, how long have I been there? I'm just trying to have normal conversation because they automatically assume pushback. They automatically assume judgment. And I'm like, yo, I'm just trying to engage with y'all. I'm just trying to love y'all. I'm just trying to serve you guys. Well, that was the first week. That was the first uh, month that we moved in. That was a year ago. Last week, Ward across the street, my, my neighbor, uh, wife calls calls us in a panic. Hey, I need Jay to come over and help. Like Ward is, uh, I, I, like Ward is really sick. He needs help getting out of bed. And so here I am, this guy that I've been building. We come out. I'll take out his trash. We have built this relationship. Here I am in this guy's house that we just engaged on our street. He is in his bed in his jammies. And his wife is saying he needs help getting into the bed. So here I am, like lifting his legs, trying to put him into the bed. He's like, no, Jay, I have to pee. <coughs> <laughs> so who gets the pee cup? Your boy. <laughs> and here I am holding a pee cup so my neighbor can pee in the cup. When you engage people, when you engage the city, it is messy, literally and figuratively. Right. But can I tell you this? Ward and Joanna, almost weekly, we're so glad that you guys moved into this house. You guys have brought something to this community that we have not experienced in decades since we lived here. They came to a church service. I don't know if they'll be back. But, but when you engage the city with a guy, like, honestly, there, I, I, I don't have anything in common with this man. Like, he can hang up his flags and, like, he can enjoy his life. But when you engage city with, like, you, can, you don't avoid stuff like that. You literally are holding cups for people to piss in. Like, honestly, I, I'm like, how on earth did I get here? Well, it's, it's the love of God that brought me to come into this man's house and hold this cup for him. So when you engage the city with the gospel, you begin to love the people of the city who don't look like you, act like you, vote like you, think like you. But it's because of the love of Jesus, you are compelled to engage because you just, you know their story, you know who they are, you know the pain points, and you begin to love on them. One of the things practically that we did as, uh, uh, that we do as a church is that we pursue solidarity over diversity. We pursue solidarity over diversity. I'm giving you a lot of, this is a lot of operating system things on how to think. 
because some of you, I'm not going to give you all the keys on the how, but man, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to help you transform the way you think about this stuff. Because when you go to another city and uh, maybe when you graduate and you move somewhere, I want you to begin to think about how the church operates that you're going into. And you're not just glamored and amazed by how cool stuff looks or how solid their Instagram feed is. But you're like, no, how does this church operate? We had to operate in solidarity over just pursuing diversity because diversity nowadays is kind of like a it's kind of like this uh, tokenism buzzword where it's like. Diversity often is tied to presence while solidarity is tied to purpose. What do I mean by that? Diversity often says, well, who's in the room and how different does everybody look? But solidarity is tied to mission because you're concerned with the cares of the room. You're concerned with what they're going through. Because of 2020, honestly, diversity was like a token thing. I can't tell you how many more privileges I got as a black guy because of 2020, and it was simply not not because people cared for me, but simply because it's like, well, diversity's in right now, so like we need to make sure that we look diverse. But 85% of churches in North America are often homogeneous, which means it's you can look diverse, but you're still monocultural. You look the part. Like I went to a Laker game recent uh, last year. Y'all, we suck right now. Um, I went to a Laker game last year. And I was like, I'm just so amazed by sports, by sporting mm-hmm. events and teams, is because everyone got the same jersey on. Yeah, I know all y'all people don't think the same way. Y'all clearly, definitely don't vote the same way or act the same way. But you're still united. You're still united by this team, by this goal. Yet, I found it fascinating. I was like, man, that looks really cool. But if you know anything about LA, the homelessness is wild. So everyone leaves the arena. This diverse group of people leaves the arena and and they're just stepping over homeless people. They're just turning a blind eye towards the person in need on the corner, right? Like you can look extremely diverse and we can clap about that and be like, oh, we have a multi-ethnic church, multi, like we're so diverse. We have this many nations, but simultaneously walk out of your church and walk past the people in your community who are in need. But when you pursue solidarity, When you engage your city with the gospel, you begin to understand what the needs are. So when I moved into this city, I went to like everything the city had to offer. Sylvan Park, the most famous, uh, one of the most well-known parks here in the city. In a span of two weeks, I went to the Juneteenth festival event, which if, if you don't know about Juneteenth, Google it. Now, I mean, federal holiday now, right? So thank God, finally. So Juneteenth, I show up, I'm looking around, one church there, historic, like historic, uh, what's it, the village? The village right here, Second Baptist Church or whatever, I think they're called the village. Um, They're the only church there. And like, I love them, I joke around with them all the time, like they're passing out like cassette tapes. I'm like, Bishop Margaret, ain't nobody using that. Like, I'll take you to Costco, I'm sure they can turn it into a CD at least or something, right? So I show up. One church, historic black church. Two weeks later, I showed up to the 4th of July parade with my kids. 17 churches, maybe, from the local community. I, I'm not saying that that's bad. It, like, celebrate, celebrate uh, 4th of July, all that stuff. But it, what it did for me is it was antennas. Because then it says, oh, when we engage the city with the gospel, we need to go to the parts where the church is not being seen and represented. And so this year, guess what we did as a church? Or this last year, we, were, we had a booth at the Juneteenth event. We, had, we, we gave volunteers. We don't have to have portrait shirts on. Give us the city shirts. We want to engage the city with the gospel. So we served. We engaged people. I, would, I, would, I could probably count at least seven families in our church who now come to portrait because we saw them there. Because they said, you know what, we've been looking for a community that looks like our sons because they need to see other men who look like them, who love Jesus, who are serving the church. And we are so glad that you showed up in this space. We were too, we added another church to the event because we wanted to remain in solidarity with the community. And so oftentimes when you engage the city, it's really easy to go. I love uh, some of the themes. It's really easy to go to what's comfortable. 
Half of our team is white. They ain't never, half of them, I had to educate them on Juneteenth, specifically. It was, they were uncomfortable at this event, but they have learned through their uncomfortability how the gospel can move in ways that they've never seen before. And so showing up and engaging the city. Practical ways we've done that. And then obviously make disciples. Again, I'm just going to, I'm going to talk more practicality on these things. Um, you got to get very clear on defining your terms. Like what is discipleship? <coughs> so for us, we just, we have a very succinct term, a uh, way to define discipleship, which we say is ordinarily living like Jesus to become like Jesus. Can you repeat that? Ordinarily living like Jesus to become like Jesus. Part of the reason we define that is because we've engaged the city, we've seen the idols, we've seen, we've experienced even the way our team like has uh, engaged in, in following Jesus, even the way our team pursues discipleship. We had to make four shifts in our mindset. I had to create four shifts in our mindset for our team and then new people that we engage with when it comes to discipleship. I'll go through these quickly. If you want to hang out over lunch, I could talk through them more. Um, more intentionally but we had to make four shifts and the first shift was discipleship being linear to circular most people think and again like you got to think everything we're thinking about we're thinking in cross-cultural terms because a lot of people who think about uh, religion or uh, having any sort of like relationship with faith so much of it is tied to like this oh uh I'm growing. It's kind of like this up and to the right type of metric. So even in like American Christianity, not a lot of people have a concept or a theology of suffering as part of their discipleship. Like, no, no, no. That doesn't mean that you're doing bad. That doesn't mean that you're going backwards. Some of some of suffering means that you're just becoming more like Jesus. And so it's, it's circular. It's not this linear thing where it's step by step. It's circular. You are slowly integrating and becoming and being formed more into him. Life is not meant to be a series of competitions or the survival of the fittest or the rat race. It's meant to engage with our creator, deepening our faith and renewing our minds as we grow deeper in love with him. The second, the second one we had to, which I've seen a lot, even in cross-cultural places like East Asia um, or Southeast Asia where we've been, but we're going from performance to process. Performance to process. You pursue discipleship not based on your performance, what has already been performed and completed on the cross. Oftentimes living in this, like one of the greatest temptations, and I can speak to this honestly because I went to CBU, I've worked there. One of the greatest temptations that many of you, if you go to CBU or, or you're involved in kind of a, a more hyper Christian uh, like atmosphere ecosystem is when you leave that space so many students and people I'm connected with struggle because they're not performing well as a Christian so much about his performance and how much you do how much you do for God kind of have that language versus man how am I being formed by God in this season you know, we often say in our church, this is not a space for you to perform for God. It's a space for you to be formed by God. And one of the key things is like, even when we have people who make a decision to follow Jesus, what do I got to do? What are the things? I'll sign up to serve. I'll sign up to do these. Now, would we love people to serve? Absolutely. Come up at 630 and help set up, please. But if you, if I, if we start to sniff out that you're doing this because now all of a sudden you think you got to perform for God, we actually don't want you to serve right now. We want you to understand that you are in process and this process is going to make you and help you become more like him. You don't live for approval. You live from approval. That's the reason why it took me seven times to share the gospel with my Muslim friend because there were so many performative metrics. There was so much fear of approval of family that we had to shift in his mind that it's not about how well you do these things for God, but being in process with him. The third shift is you've got to shift from exceptional to ordinary. So this is why I use the term ordinarily following Jesus. It's because a lot of times you can come to a conference, you can come to things, and you think, man, life is lived in these very exceptional moments. Not saying that these moments are not 
key, these moments cannot be helpful. I think that they are. But most of life, if you were to ask Brian, if you were to ask Jacob, guys who are seasoned in life, who have families even, like most of discipleship happens in very ordinary moments. Mm -hmm. Where you show up to shop, where you, where you t like on the kids, uh, like watching this kids play on the field and those conversations, like how you treat your family at home when no one's looking, all these ordinary moments, these moments that you could actually live out right now as you're walking on campus, as you're going to, a, a, to your favorite place to eat or a coffee shop, these ordinary moments are all part of your discipleship, not at the conference, not in a chapel, not just at those places. And we had to get our people to think, yo, we're, when you show up in Trader Joe's, it's part of your discipleship. When you go out and have a meal, it's part of your discipleship. The way you celebrate, the way you mourn, all of these things are part of your discipleship. Ordinary moments, things that you experience on the regular. Some of you probably need to go to a different coffee shop. Seriously. I, I did a coffee shop exegesis out here. I can tell you who goes to what coffee shop, what type of people that go there. And honestly, sometimes I go to the worst coffee shop because I know, like, yo, the nations are up in here. This coffee is terrible. I don't even like coffee that much. Like, the stuff in here is bad. But, man, when I look across, this is Revelation 5 and 7. This is where I'm going to... This is where I'm going to sit. Some of y'all need to stop going to Daily Brew. Stop so going to Arcade, maybe. Anyways. What's up? Oh, Daily Brew sucks anyways. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you have to go that far. But, <laughs> I love Scott. But I'm just saying, like, when, you, when, you, when you're hyper aware of the ordinary spaces that you're involved in, you begin to, like, engage the city, think about making disciples, and think, oh, man, yeah, you know what? It's not as good here, but, like, man, I'm noticing the type of people that are in here the conversations that I'm having, man, like this is, there's an opportunity here. It doesn't have to be in just simply exceptional moments. The last one is a shift from information to formation. We live in a world of information overload. Um, I think right now one of the greatest temptations is, is, yeah, how much you know. Like a lot of scholars have said in the past, um, those who had kind of the upper hand in society were those with like the greatest physical strength. And nowadays, it's being seen as those who have the most intellect. So that's why guys like the Jordan Petersons of the world, the Joe, even the Joe Rogans of the world, it's like the, the information overload, who knows the most is like, who's king? But a Harvard study said, we are the most over-informed generation and under-formed generation at the same time. And so, and, and you hear all throughout what they're saying, like take all this stuff, but then you gotta go act on it. And so it did nothing for my team to spend six months together with all this information if they weren't being formed, if they weren't actually taking steps to do it. And so you engage the city with the gospel, you make disciples, and, and for us, again, it was building a depth, how we define these things, building a framework, and then we planted a church. September 10th, uh, Portrait Church was planted, and we've seen God uh, do some incredible things. We've partnered with other churches, even in our city, Think about Jonah and Pathway. Yo, we, one of our values as a church is we pursue the kingdom over the empire. And so we, we link with other churches. Pastor Josh came um, from Pathway literally a mile. Y'all not even a mile from us. He came and preached. He killed it. At the end, I said, hey, look, if some of y'all like him more, and it's going to help you get on mission, and it's going to help you advance the kingdom, man, go to Pathway, please. If you, like, I don't, it, it's not, it's not about planting services and growing people. It's about seeing God's kingdom advance. And so let's be a part of that. So again, I end with just Luke 4. Uh, when it was a day, he made out and he made his way to a deserted place, but the crowds were searching for him. They came to him and they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, it is necessary for me to proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God to the other towns also because I was sent for this purpose. Um, be careful in your pursuit of finding a church and places. Be careful of people or leaders um, who are more concerned with the crowd than the, the advancement of the kingdom. They'll draw a crowd, but I love Jesus, man. So many times, like your boy was like, ah, crowd, I'm gonna go over here. Ah, crowd, I'm gonna go spend time with the Father. And so we live in a world where it's easy to draw crowds. Um, my encouragement is be mindful and to consider how a church operates. And man, I would encourage you to, to be a part of a church plant. 
um, invest in one or be a part of one that has a global, like we have two people in our church that might be going overseas to plant a church. Like everything that we're doing as a church, aside from a few different marketing things, which we just contextualize for our area, they could replicate in any part of the country. And, and I would feel confident that they would see a church planted. So thank you for your time.